We're going to be in Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, and uh, it's been quite a journey through the book of Romans. This is the last chapter uh, in the journey, and I've enjoyed it, and uh, praying about where we'll go next in the scriptures, but uh, for now we're going to begin in verse 1, Romans chapter 16. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the, of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved, my beloved Eponitus, or whatever his name is, <laughs> who is the first fruit of Achaia in Christ. Greet Mary, who's labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachis, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord, greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobas, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those are such for, for those are who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Cordus, our brother, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. And we, as we sang just a moment ago, we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes. And as the psalmist prayed, open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law. And we pray that you help us to understand it. And by your Holy Spirit, apply it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to draw your attention back to one interesting phrase in the text, and that's in verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, how many of you put this commandment or this phrase, this idea into practice this morning when you came into church? I didn't see any of it, but uh, I was just wondering if anybody actually, uh, maybe you read ahead and, and, and thought maybe we should start doing that. Uh, how many of you want to? All right. Well, good. Uh, so what, what is a holy kiss? Well, it's an expression of acceptance and fellowship. Now, I'm glad that we don't literally kiss each other in our culture. I think the germs get passed around easily enough uh, that we don't want to do that. But ki kissing people on the cheek or the forehead, uh, that's a normal mode of greeting in other cultures. And it was definitely a a mode of greeting in ancient Israel and in, in ancient Rome. And so what is Paul telling them to do here when he says, greet one another with a holy kiss? Well, he's encouraging the church to affectionately greet one another. And this is appropriate and it is beneficial for the church. And we can translate that principle into our modern Western equivalent 
and that is shake hands or bump elbows or say hello or um, fist bump, whatever you need to do. You know, during flu season, it kind of morphs a little bit from a handshake into maybe an elbow bump uh, into a maybe, hey, hello, <laughs> how are you doing? We'll at least smile, right? Um, and, and there are really two essential elements to this principle. One is to greet one another. That's pretty obvious. And the second part of the principle is to do this with an expression of affection, an expression of brotherly love or sisterly love. And the affectionate greeting expressed in, in, in these actions really brings about a larger or really pictures a larger reality. And that is a holy fellowship. And so what Paul is calling on them to do is expressing, the action is expressing this larger reality of a holy fellowship. I want you to notice that Paul calls it not just a kiss, but a holy kiss. Now, I don't think that Paul is trying to make sure that there's no unholy kissing going on, like, like he's in charge of a youth group or something like that. I, I don't think he's trying to differentiate holy kissing from unholy kissing here. Um, rather, I believe Paul calls the kiss holy because it is an expression of a holy fellowship. The greeting is holy because the fellowship is holy. And the pas this passage really is all about the holy fellowship of the church. And, and we are commanded to express that holy fellowship with a holy greeting. Uh, the handshake, the fist bump, the elbow bump, even the hello is, is holy because the fellowship is holy. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans from the city of Corinth, and then he sent it by the hand of a trusted woman named Phoebe. And uh, that's why Paul comm commends to them Phoebe. He says, I commend you our sister Phoebe. He wants them to receive Phoebe into their holy fellowship. And this holy fellowship is something that greatly benefits all believers. And consider, for instance, uh, just, just with me, consider two, just two of the greatest fellowship benefits here in this holy fellowship. One um, is that the holy fellowship gives us a family. In Mark chapter 10, verse 29, is, we're, we're backing off of Paul now, going to Jesus, but Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold, a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Um, what is Jesus talking about right here? Well, many people lose things for the sake of Christ. They might lose a house or even a family, especially if their families, uh, family members uh, disown them as a result to them coming to Christ or some kind of strife is there now that wasn't there before. Uh, Jesus promised that he would repay such people that not only would he do that in the world to come? But he's going to do that now in this life. That's what he says right there in verse 20, in, in verse um, um, 30, all right? Did I get that right? Verse, yeah, receive a hundredfold in this time, he says, in this time, all right? And so it's kind of easy for me to say, well, you know, in, in, in the world to come. But he says in this time, and that's kind of harder to understand. How does this work? Well, it worked for Paul. And let me show you how it worked for Paul. In our text, verse 13, Paul says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. That's not the dog, that's a brother. All right, greet, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Now, is Paul a physical brother of Rufus? No. All right? He's not. Um, in fact, Rufus was probably a Gentile, and Paul was a Jewish person. Um, but at some point, Paul and Rufus uh, had a friendship, and Rufus's mother became kind of a mother to Paul. And I'm not sure what Paul's relationship was like with his biological mother, but if you remember Paul's testimony, he was a zealous Jew. He was a, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, 
And when he converted from Judaism to Christ, his former friends were trying to kill him. So if his friends are doing that, what's it like with his family? Now, I don't know for certain whether his mother, um, you know, accepted him, but it's very likely if his mother was still alive, he, he may have lost her to death, but it's very likely that Paul... Uh, you know, at least traveling all over the place, didn't have much of a family connection. And here is Rufus, his mother. And Paul looks at her and says, yeah, she's my mom too. You know, he has gained family now in this time. Now, Paul gained much more later on in the life to come. Uh, That doesn't even compare, but at least we could say in this life, Paul has gained family. This is a feature of the Holy Fellowship that we enjoy in the body of Christ. Look at um, how Paul expressed this family feature when he's instructing Timothy. Timothy was a pastor and Paul is mentoring him. And look at how Paul speaks of this to Timothy. Do not rebuke, 1 Timothy chapter 5, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. This, this ought to be how we think about one another, about other Christians, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers. It's a family, and Paul gained that family, and we gained that family, even if, even if a, a other family is far away or forsaken us or anything like that. Um, you say, well, you know, in this church, there's some people I don't want to be family with, and or in, in you don't know what you know. What, I've been in churches in the past. I don't want to be family with that person. Well, you know, that's how it is with your regular family, right? Uh, everybody's got that one crazy uncle or something that just makes the Thanksgiving conversation really interesting, right? Uh, and uh, do you say that's not my uncle? No, you don't. All right. Um, so that's really beside the point, but. But uh, you, you gain a family with the family of God, right? That's, that's a wonderful feature of the Holy Fellowship, a wonderful benefit. Here's another benefit of the Holy Fellowship, and that is Holy Fellowship sanctifies us. It is a means by which God works in our hearts to make us more like Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the Bible says, and let us not consider, or let us consider one another in order to stir up to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching and so this sacred assembly this holy fellowship creates an environment where christians are used of god to sanctify other christians iron sharpens iron here and we you know you you have to be around the world for six days out of the week. And when you come apart on the seventh day, actually the first day of the week, come apart on the Lord's day, you get to be around God's people. And that has a sanctifying um, um, effect on us. And so we ought to treasure this holy fellowship. And, and, and we should express the fact that we value this holy fellowship in our actions, including warm Christian greetings. Those greetings need to be warm this morning, right? And so does Grace Baptist Church fit this description of a holy fellowship? Um, Don't worry, I'm not going to prescribe holy kissing, all right, to uh, warm up the fellowship. We're not going to do that, uh, and and, uh, that's good. But uh, we're going to take just a survey of this passage this morning and skim the surface. And we're going to take maybe a, maybe a, a thousand foot view and uh, we'll get more into the particulars of the passage uh, later on in the coming weeks as we finish out this, this uh, study of the book of Romans. But our survey is going to demonstrate, as we look at this from the thousand point view, I want to demonstrate that uh, if our church would be a holy fellowship, we must meet three requirements. And so there are three things that are required of us if our church is going to really meet this description of a holy fellowship. And so let's remember these three three things. First of all, a holy fellowship requires us to participate with its people. It, this is an active fellowship, not a passive organization. And uh, that's what sets church apart as unique from many other organizations is that uh, it is not something where you just... 
pay your money, come in and just watch. It is an active fellowship. And so participation is required. And Paul expresses that requirement with a direct command. And, and, uh, whoops, I got ahead of myself. Uh, So the direct command is there in verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And the command implies uh, personal responsibility. We are to take this upon ourselves. And so now, who are we to greet? And the text says to greet one another. Now, if you've read the New Testament, you'll see many one another texts. That term one another appears all over the New Text, all over the New Testament, and it usually refers to fellow Christians. And so, who are we to greet? Fellow Christians. Greet one another with a holy kiss. How are we to greet one another? He says a holy kiss, that's a physical token of affection. And you cannot give a holy kiss in absentia. All right? Or to translate this into our context, you can't shake hands with someone if you're not there with them. Um, You cannot hug a brother or sister on Facebook Live or on Zoom, right? We we do live stream services and and, um, we do that. Uh, for those who can't be with us, and and we uh, we would love for you to be with us. You just there are some 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 folks who just can't get out and be with us. There may be people here this morning or or not here this morning that usually would be, but are prevented by weather or different factors like that. And uh, so I'm not uh, believe me, I'm not trying to denigrate what you're doing this morning. We're glad you're online with us. But inter- internet church is a lot like putting that fireplace video on your big screen TV in the living room. I love to do this at Christmas time. Um, and, and you can see that it looks cor- cozy. It looks warm. It looks inviting. It's in 4K ultra high definition, right? And you can hear it. The one that I like to put on, uh, it, has, um, it has these crackling sounds as the fire is is fake burning there and and uh but go ahead and uh and turn that on on your tv and and step up to it and put your hands out and try to try to warm them get a marshmallow put a marshmallow uh on a stick and hold it up what's going to happen nothing right the warmth is not there and the tv fire uh cannot reproduce the main purpose of the real fireplace and that is heat right heat. And I put that thing on at Christmas time. I always get up before everybody else. We got the Christmas tree up and I want a fireplace. I turn that thing on. It's great. It, it, it gives me the feels, right? Um, but it doesn't smell like a fire. And uh, some people don't like that. I like that. Uh, and uh, I grew up with a fireplace in the house. So, uh, and, and then it doesn't feel like a fire, right? Oh, the warmth of real holy fellowship. Every time you extend warm Christian greetings, you participate. And so there's much more to it than handshakes, but I I think you get the idea. We are required to participate because basically we're commanding. There's a direct command here. Now there's also uh, a demonstrated concern here. Paul says, greet um, one another with a holy kiss. And then he sends this on to them. He says, the churches of Christ greet you. And Paul is an apostle of the churches to the, of, of the Gentiles, and so he feels the liberty really to speak for them and speak on their behalf. And he sends their greetings, their expressions of fellowship to the churches. I'm sure he's in contact with them, perhaps. Uh, he, through him, maybe they exchange these types of greetings. Um, and this Christian family is an extended family. It spans across towns and cities and states and countries and continents, and even across church bodies. You know, we have a local church here, but there are other, I'm sure you're friends with other Christians that go to other churches, and you can share the same type of fellowship. It's not exactly the same as being in your same local church, but you can share um, that fellowship with Christians in other churches and in other states and other countries. Um, and, and Christians care for Christians all around the world. Have you ever met a Christian while you're traveling and just hit it off? And the reason why you did is not because you have the same favorite sports team or you're from the same hometown or something like that, but it's because you begin to talk about the Lord. When we uh, went to um, Yellowstone and Grand Teton camping a few years ago and my parents came with us, 
Um, and we were among a crowd of people at this beautiful waterfall, which looks like it's way out in the middle of nowhere and no one would be there with you, but there's a crowd of people there, you know, standing on a landing and we're all taking turns so we could stand there and pretend no one else is there and take our picture in nature, right? And as we're doing that, my dad and this other guy, they just start talking. Um, and uh, the other guy expressed that he was a Christian and they, they talked like they'd known each other all their lives. And they were talking about the Lord. Why? Because they're brothers, they never met before. They're brothers. The fellowship uh, just spontaneously appeared there. And, uh, and it was really neat. I, I, I was just people watching. Just, it was really kind of neat to watch. I know when we went to Bolivia uh, back in 2016, we couldn't even talk to most of the people without an interpreter. But you know what? There was just something there, some kind of fellowship. Uh, and uh, it's just hard to explain, but you can experience it. And so the, the extended family demonstrates their concern for each other. The churches of Christ greet you, he says. And Paul demonstrated his personal concern for the people in this church at Rome. And as we read the text, we read almost the whole chapter. Did you notice a repeated word in that text? There were several repeated words, but what was the most prominent one? Greet, right? Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Greet uh, Epinetus or whatever his name is. Greet Mary and Andronicus and Junia and Amplius and greet Urbanus and Rufus and so on and so forth. And Paul attaches a personal note to each greeting. What is he doing? He's demonstrating his personal concerns in relationship with those people. He calls them many times, he calls them beloved. People that he loves. And it is personal concern that brings us to participate genuinely in this holy fellowship. If you view the church mainly as a place that you go to get something, you're going to be discouraged from time to time from being faithful because not every Sunday is going to be an amazing experience. Some Sundays you're going to come and guess what? The sermon's going to be less than stellar, right? Don't tell me about it, but uh, I mean, sometimes you come and the sermon is going to be less than stellar. Sometimes you're going to come and a person you wanted to talk to, they didn't come that Sunday. Uh, sometimes the weather's going to be lousy. Sometimes the weather's going to be great and you'd rather be somewhere else on that day, right? And, and so uh, if you view church as just the place you come to get something, uh, if, if now you do come to get something, so you shouldn't view it as not somewhere where you come to get something. But if that's all you see in it, you're going to be discouraged often from being faithful. But if you view uh, church mainly as a family with whom you are personally connected and for whom you are personally concerned, you will always be encouraged to participate. And that's what a holy fellowship requires. First, it requires us to participate with its people. And now consider uh, a second requirement. Holy fellowship requires us to plug into its power. Um, the holy fellowship of Christians cannot exist and cannot be sustained by the force of our wills or the constancy of our characters. We cannot just make it happen because it ought to happen and we want it to happen. Uh, this holy fellowship must be empowered by God. And we individually must be connected to that power. We must plug into that power. Holy fellowship is powered by union with Christ. Believers are united with Christ. Notice how many times as Paul greets these believers and, and he describes them with these words, in the Lord, in Christ Jesus, in Christ. And, and he's describing them over and over and over again with those phrases. What is he saying there? Well, he's saying a person cannot come into true fellowship or he's implying, he's not technically saying this on purpose, but He's implying that a, a person cannot come into true fellowship with the church of Christ without being united uh, by faith with Christ. It's the church of Christ. So nobody, let me put it this way, nobody is born a Christian. You cannot be made right with God through attending services and through your good efforts and, and, and through uh, Christian rituals. To be reconciled to God and to be joined to his church, you must 
repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must have the Holy Spirit living in your heart. Uh, we, we are familiar with John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the key issue when it comes to are you or are you not united to the fellowship of Christ? And how does that work? Well, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having been uh, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Saved from sin, saved from wrath, reconciled to God. When you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus who died for you was buried and rose again. When you believe that, you're born again. And you're united with him, with Christ. Romans chapter 6 outlines all of that. For sake of time, we won't go into that. But he is the power of the holy fellowship. If all of us are united to Christ, we have the most important thing in common. Because believers are united uh, not just to Christ, but to the church. Um, uh, United in fact sisters, brothers, saints. And so that unites us together. Uh, Notice these familial terms that Paul is using to address the church. Uh, They are family. Well, how are they family? Not just by their own declaration, but by the power of the gospel. When each one of them believed in Christ, they were instantly saved from sin, adopted into the family of God, and immersed into the church by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. That one body is the church, the bride of Christ. And so holy fellowship is powered by union with Christ. And holy fellowship, for those who are united together and united to Christ through the gospel, then holy fellowship is also powered by our union in cause. Um, Paul loved so many people in the church of Rome because they served the same cause that he served. Um, And so when you are pulling in one direction and someone is pulling with you, there is a uniting factor there. Uh, And that cause for them was the cause of the gospel. This was uh, dearest to Paul's heart. That's what he lived for, proclaiming the gospel. Look at how Paul describes these fellow workers with him in the same cause. He calls them servant. Someone with business, Phoebe had business. She was a helper. He talks about fellow workers and fellow laborers and those who labored hard in the gospel. Priscilla and Aquila, he highlights them as prime examples that they were believers united in the cause. They had helped Paul plant a church in Corinth in in, uh, Acts chapter 18. They made tents with Paul for financial support. And at some point, there was danger to Paul's life and they put their own lives at risk to benefit Paul, to save his life. And now they are back in Rome. They had been kicked out of Rome uh, and they had returned to Rome. Uh, And even then they're hosting a, a meeting of the church in Rome. There would be several house churches throughout the city and they were hosting one in their house. They were fellow workers in the gospel cause. Now there are Christians in the church who all pull in the same direction a gospel direction, serving in ministries, sacrificing personal time, volunteering, seeking to encourage other members, witnessing and giving and serving. And and we thank God for that. And we are united in mission. At the same time, uh, somebody can wear your uniform and be on your team and still not have be serving the same cause maybe not even pulling in the same direction if you don't believe that then you should watch the rose bowl from 1929 you thought i was going to go like michigan won the rose bowl this year they did by the way but the rose bowl in 1929 featured a game between georgia tech and cal uh, cal short for california and georgia tech fumbled the football at a crucial point in the game and and the center from Cal named Roy Regals picked up the ball and he raced 
toward the end zone. But just as Roy Regals was about to reach the goal line, his own teammate tackled him. Can you imagine that? Why would his teammate do that? Well, because Roy Regals had picked up the ball and run the wrong direction. <laughs> he almost went into the wrong end zone. And, and even though Cal did not get into the end zone, Regals did not get into the end zone, they took over possession at the one-yard line, and Georgia Tech subsequently tackled them in the end zone for a safety and went on to win the game. And Roy Regals earned the nickname Wrong Way Regals. <laughs> there are a lot of Christians who run the wrong way. They aren't interested in serving the cause of the gospel as much as they're interested in their own agenda. And that can be anything because everybody's a little different, right? They would rather score points against the gospel team if it means that they get to be the one holding the ball. And such people appear in our text. Holy fellowship requires three things. One, it requires that we participate with its people. It also requires that we plug into its power. But now consider a third requirement. Holy fellowship requires us to protect its purity. Never forget that the enemies of the gospel are active. And those enemies of the gospel sometimes call themselves preacher or evangelist or apostle or brother or sister. Because of this, we need to protect the purity of the fellowship. Paul describes these people to the church at Corinth. He does that um, in verse in 2 Corinthians, it should be 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I think it's 2 Corinthians, maybe it's 1st, I can't remember. Uh, but I have, anyway, 1 of the Corinthians chapter 11 uh, and verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Whether believers or unbelievers, those who try to tear down the Holy Fellowship are ministers of Satan. That is, they are doing the devil's work. And it is from these people that we are supposed to, to protect the fellowship. And back in our text in verses 17 through 20, Paul it equips us to do this. And so he says in verse 17, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them for those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, we are going to go into detail on this at a later date. We're going to work our way uh, through this passage. I don't want to get into all the details, but let me just give you the bare bones of what Paul is, is saying here this morning when it comes to protecting the purity of the fellowship. Um, first of all, he gives us some instructions for protecting this purity. And the instructions has to do with this identifying those who threaten the purity of the fellowship. Um, and, and how do you identify? What, what identifying marks are there? He says, note those who cause divisions and offenses. So here are the marks. They are the people who cause divisions and offenses. And now, false teachers, they cause divisions. False teachers can divide a church. They can divide churches. There are people uh, who'll, be, who'll, who'll hop from church to church to church and cause a problem in every one of them, right? And just when they get the pot stirred up where everybody's mad, then they, then they leave and go to another church. And if you talk to them, they've never found a church that is a godly church. They, everywhere they go, those churches are compromisers. They don't know the truth and yada, yada, yada. And they never seem to point out or come to the conclusion that, hey, there's one consistent factor in all of these churches, and that's me, right? Uh, they, they never seem to notice that. And so there are false teachers that can divide a church or divide churches. Um, 
and they do this a lot of times by causing offenses. Now, what does offenses here mean? And it, can, it can mean uh, uh, just, just offending people. Some people are just offensive, <laughs> uh, some on purpose, some not on purpose, but that's not the main reason, the, the main thing that this word offenses mean. It, it really means a cause for falling or a temptation to sin, a trap. If you could imagine uh, maybe throwing something down in front of somebody so they would trip over it. It would be like you're, you know, if you had young kids and they leave their Legos out in the middle of the night and you get up to use the restroom and you're, 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 you're barefooted, right? And those Legos are sharper than samurai swords at three o'clock in the morning. And there is a cause to trip in your way, right? It's never happened in my house, but... Uh, <laughs> so, now, uh, how do false teachers divide churches and cause Christians to be offended or to fall into sin or even to fall away from the faith? Um, they cause... What they do is they contradict the doctrine of the apostles... There is a body of doctrine from which uh, a, a church can depart, a person can depart. They go contrary, he says here, they, they, they cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. All right? So what is that? Well, usually that's what when Paul or, or another apostle mentions that in writing in the New Testament. They're talking about the apostles' doctrine, like in Acts 2.42, where the church continued daily in the apostles' doctrine. That is the body of doctrine that they taught. It's what we find in the New Testament. And it is, it, it is, not, um, <clears throat> it is not the people who insist on biblical purity who divide churches. No, it is those who resist doctrine and holiness. Those are the ones that divide churches. False teachers contradict the Bible. Um, and we'll get into that, again, more particulars later. But uh, these, are, these are the basic characteristics. They, they cause divisions and they cause people to fall away from the apostles' doctrine. Now, what are we to do with such people? He says to note them, to mark them, to identify them, and then exclude them, avoid them. All right? Now, that seems like a drastic step, but the stakes are very high. All right? The stakes are very high. Uh, he says in verse, um, um, let's see here. He's, he's given us some instruction for protecting our purity. Now he's going to give us some inspiration. Why should we so zealously protect the purity of our fellowship? So zealously that we exclude these false teachers. Well, he says you should exclude them. Here's some motivation. Because they are disloyal to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They refuse the Lordship of Christ and they serve really their own desires. In verse 18, he says, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of of the simple and so they're serving themselves they're not in united in mission with us they're not following the lord's commands their mission is to serve their own desires and appetites and what do they do they deceive naive christians or people who are not christians that are in that are coming to church or something like that and they, they just don't have that discernment and how do they desert how do they deceive him they have some smooth talk man they're good talkers and flattery and uh and so they destroy gospel ministries, and I would say they're even delegates of Satan. That's why Paul promises in verse 20, God, the God of peace, will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And so we must protect the purity of our holy fellowship. Do you value the holy fellowship of this church and even the holy fellowship that you enjoy uh, beyond the walls of this church, beyond the, the boundaries of this local church with other Christians? Do you do you value that? You will protect what you value. Isn't it amazing that this sermon started with a holy kiss and ends on a warning to mark and avoid certain people? Um, now, how are those two things related? I mean, a holy kiss is very affectionate. Mark and avoid, not very affectionate, right? But think about this. Judas Iscariot placed a kiss on the cheek of Jesus. And that was one of the most unholy acts that have ever been committed. And so if our church is going to be a holy fellowship, 
we must participate with his people. We must plug into its power. We must protect, protect his purity. Are you part of the Holy Fellowship? Have you been united to Christ in salvation? If not, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you either later this week or I'm, I always keep office hours or come and talk to me after the service. I would be glad to show you the gospel. Um, are you running the right way? Are you united in fellowship and united in the cause of Christ with, with the church? Uh, take these commandments to heart and, and maybe emulate the concerns of the Apostle Paul, how he loved all these people he called out by name. Are you jealous for the truth, for the purity uh, and the unity of our church? Take it upon yourself to reject false teachers and to, and to love this fellowship and to greet one another with a holy handshake or expression of affection, something like that. Well, let's stand together and we'll go to the Lord in prayer.